My name is Ophelia Esparza. Uh, I'm from East Los Angeles, where I was born. I still live near about four blocks where I was. I've been here all my life. Uh, I'm a, a retired school teacher. I taught at City Terrace Elementary all my career, 28 years. I have nine children. Uh, I, all my children are also altar makers. My beginnings with ofrendas or altars really began, well, through my mother, but her, my experiences were all about learning about her great-grandmother who taught her. So I would say we're, I'm, my, we're a fifth generation of, of altar makers, altaristas, as the word was coined to call what I do. Uh, but all the stories I know were about Mama Pula, Hipólita Tinoco, my mother's great-grandmother who raised her. And she is the matriarch, the person that I always call to, uh, besides my mother, to attend to me, to inspire me, to strengthen me in all the work that I do. Uh, she's been a force in my life since I was a child. My mother never spoke about anything without mentioning her. So I felt like as if I knew her personally, just from my mother's stories. Uh, one of the things that I remember the most with of altar making for the other muertos was my mother's humble but you know, devoted altar she had at home. My mother would dress them up for special occasions four times a year that I recall uh, for for the other muertos, which was also connected to our trip to the local El Calvario Cemetery, walking distance of where I still live. And uh, I'll tell you more about that. But the other, the other three altars were uh, Sábado de Gloria, Holy Saturday, but my mother would dress her our little humble adobe space with flowers from her garden, which she grew gladiolas, uh, chrysanthemums, daisies and calla lilies and those were all dressed in white so many of her uh, all of her altars were really rooted in you know of course the the religious uh, observances but she brought in her tradition of where she came from a little town in Guanimaro, Guanajuato which is right near the border of Michoacan and so uh, over the years, I've learned that, that, that the re El Reino de los Purépecha, that region is called. And so her customs were different from the experiences my friends had, who were all, almost all were immigrants from Mexico. And so her celebrations had this really beautiful twist, I, I would say, to, you know, as I would describe it to my friends. For instance, the, the ofrendas, she, she made decorations for other people, coronas, uh, things for weddings and uh, baptisms made with flowers or paper flowers that she would make from her garden uh, for velorios and she would make crosses and coronas and piñas made out of paper for weddings. All this paper crafting that was fascinating. So I learned along with her, I would help her. And so, and then of course the biggest altar she made was a nacimiento, and that's what she was mostly known for, because it was a huge endeavor. Uh, over the years, she had collected mostly things from Mexico. I don't know how she traveled with all these small items, but she had some were very old, and then some she acquired, or through her uh, trips to Mexico, she never lost connection with her pueblo. She went back almost every year and visited Juanimaro and her. And so all this story, you know, gathered in my lifetime, living always next to my mother. And all the things I learned from her were creative things. Uh, she passed, you know, her creative energy was something that I just, that was part of me. <laughs> and so the stories about Mama Pola always emerged, always were part of her everyday talk and all the things she did, the cooking, the tamales de ceniza, and all the process. And, but she would describe the process of working with Mama Pola and how Mama Pola would make these, all these food items from, from maize and sell them in the, in the plaza. 
and show she was known for her excellent cooking. And Mama Pola, who raised her, was a single woman. So she, my mother was raised by this strong, older woman and learned all of her crafts, all of her celebrations, all of her cook, culinary arts. And so my mother just was a, a history in itself, you know, of just her background and that little town and how it was so rooted in celebrations that were really different. Uh, my mother said they used to have, there still is a uh, Ojo de Agua near the town. It's up on a hillside. It's a very small town and there's only agriculture around. It's, and um, the pe for any celebration, personal like birthdays or weddings, they'd go to that Ojo de It was a, 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 a pathway, a, 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 actually a small journey to trek up to that area. It was on a, on a rise on a, on a hillside and people would gather there and, and have their, their parties, their celebrations. And my mother would say, ah, lo que me gustaba, about those parties that as people were coming back and I would see the women, they would wear white skirts and the men would wear the calzón, they called the Muslim, you know, uh, food, clothes. Uh, they be tintas, tintadas de, of reddish, uh, dripping with, with dye their, their clothes, their skirts, and their feet, and their pants. Because in their, in their celebrations, when they had dancing, the best dancers, the tributes, they would have cantaros of, my mother would call it jarabe or something, but there was a this red uh, drink, and they would break it at their feet as a tribute to their outstanding dancing. And so on the way back, all the people who had the dark, they were the best, everybody knew they were the best dancers in that party. <laughs> and so those things were just, res have resonated with me, very tied to our, our indigenous roots. And I always wanted to know more and more about it. Uh, and it wasn't until my adulthood that I really started delving into that history. And, uh, but my mother's stories just kept that alive and added, you know, flavor and, actually curiosity for me, knowledge of our culture, so beautiful and rich. So my mother had cousins here who had come from Onimero and they would gather at our house. Uh, my mother uh, always, her house was like the hub and we lived in a little bit house here in East LA, the last of the adobe houses. But in those gatherings, they would talk about Onimero, their childhood and the people there, so it just reinforced this image I had, like I had been in Wanimero all my life, although I didn't visit it until 2002. In my mother's nacimiento, she would make a little flower, make cut out of paper. It was folded three times. It was six leaves, and it was the flor de San Nicolas that she would decorate her nacimientos with, from the 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 bush, the flowering bush all around that area, the fields, and so that's how they would gather those and and decorate the nacimientos. But when she was here, she learned to make this little flower to represent La Flor de San Nicolás. And the first time in 2002, I w my sister and I were approaching in our car, Bonimaro, and I started to see the fields. <laughs> I felt, oh, wow, I'm home. I recognize these little flowers. Those must be Las Flores de San Nicolás. It was just, um, I mean, I've always been rooted Chupanimaro, even though I never went there. I've always been connected to Mama Pula, although I never met her. But then, about 10 years ago, after my mother died, she left lots of photographs. She, that's one thing I'm so grateful. She had so many photographs and studio photographs of family and us and all of us. And in one box of, full of negatives, uh, I gave them to my son, who, who, Ben, who always is working with photography and printing. So he started developing some of those negatives. And one year, about 10 years ago, he says, I have a surprise for you, Mom. <laughs> and she brought this photograph. <laughs> and I must have been about three months of Mama Pola holding me in her arms. And my brother Rudy's behind me. So Mama Pola helped raise her, her sister, my great great aunt, my grandmother, my mother, and then helped my mother with Rudy, by the, and of course she carried me. 
She went back to Mexico during the repatriations. Although she wasn't repatriated, but neighbors all around us here in East LA were being repatriated. And she said, no quiero morirme en esta tierra bárbara. Quiero morir en mi tierra. And so she went back with the neighbors and went back to Guanimaro. So all those stories are just so alive and so, those connections are strong. <laughs> and uh, I think that it's very much alive in, in, with me and my brother and now with my children because I always talk about her. And so it's like they, I think they've begun to know her too. One of the beautiful things in 1990, uh, we get a call from Mary Villa, Villarreal, who was a partner with Amy Kitchener, and they came to interview my mother. I don't think Amy Kitchener came then. It was Mary Villarreal, a folklorist who had heard about my mother's nacimientos because all the neighborhood knew about them. And she was, and then she would, she started making some at the church, not in the church, but in the hall. And I, and, and also for our lady of Guadalupe, they would call her. She became known for that, but it was, you know, just within the community and in her neighborhood. And my mother would celebrate it with food and she had madrinas, they were her, her madrinas from Juanimaro, they kept this friendship here, with my aunts there. So it was a continuation of all these celebrations, the way they celebrate with colacion and tamales de ceniza and puñuelos and atole blanco that were just part of this celebration. So in 1990, the, the Southwest Museum was doing, or they were doing this folklore, folk life festival on nacimientos in Los Angeles. And so they called, they came over and interviewed and asked, told us about, and they invited us to be part of that exhibit. They had chosen seven families and we were one of them. So my mother got to, oh, they, her nacimiento that year, it was, it was always in the living room. And uh, it wasn't as elaborate like the previous years that Papa used to help her. Uh, when the earlier years, when I was growing up with my stepdad, Papa, he died in 1975. He would help her, and my, he would do whatever my, mira, quiero esto, he would do it. And we had these elaborate nacimientos where people would come in. They would make these hillsides. I think she recre recreated Guanimaro in her nacimientos, because they had these cerros with actual dirt and, and maigueyes and nopales stuck in them and all kinds of animals, you know, just typical, I think, because I've seen nacimientos that people make there. So, but the stories were about Juanimaro. So I always say, when I was 13, I didn't actually do help her with the nacimientos in my early years because it was her, you know, she, ella mandaba ahí. But then, you know, when I started helping her, I, I drew a backdrop for the nacimiento. It was huge. It was an amanta and it covered the corner of the sala. But it was, uh, a scene from Mexico and I would look at books and those, that's what I knew from my mother's description of her pueblo. It was never Bethlehem and it was never, uh, you know, I don't know, it, it was Mexican. <laughs> Jesus was Mexican. <laughs> and uh, although her, her misterio was, you know, the typical Italian made uh, misterios, but everything else was from Mexico. And, she created, you know, villages and cascadas and lakes, and it's traditional, many people do that. But before that, I don't know how we got invited in 1990 to the 1984 Olympic Folk Life Festival at Plaza. I, I think I was already doing things at Plaza because they had, uh, the other man they called in, they, it was for altares. The other man was Miguel Dominguez. He was a professor at UC, I think Dominguez Hills, I'm not sure. He and his father did a nacimiento. And another woman, Socorro Ibarra, she did a, 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 a altar for the La Dolorosa, these religious ones. But we did the nacimiento. And so we, at Plaza, it was a big event, lots of artisans, they, there's a catalog for that. And so I, that was not 84, but in the 1990s when we were called, contacted by uh, Mary Villarreal. And the, her partner the, in that project was Michael Heisley. 
He was a folklorist too. And then uh, Amy Kitchener, I, I, I knew her, I think that was, she, I think we were together but for that project, but then I met Amy for uh, continuing interviews. They were gonna do, they did a series of folk uh, cultural booklets on, on cultural workers. And I, I didn't, never got on it, but it was one of the plans and they did one for uh, two people in, in Lincoln Heights. And I have the two books. So that never happened, but you know, I, then I applied for the apprenticeship and I got it for 2002 with Elena was my apprentice. And then later 2012 with you. And so I, I would like to do it again for my other children because I want them to be, they are already altaristas and they're doing work with their own communities. So I would like for them to be recognized too, you know, the, for the work they're doing. And so I hope that I, we can do that with Denise and Javier and Alec, because <laughs> they're really prominent now in what they're doing. And so full circle, we're still doing altars in a way that is so much more than what I'm known for is Day of the Dead, of course, but through self help graphics, because that's what they celebrated. But it's a life journey that is beyond making altars. It's, it's a way of, uh, I think, a style of thinking, of living, a uh, community thing. I'm getting teary-eyed. <laughs> because it's, uh, it's a plan for the future with your families, with your ancestors. They're always there. And uh, it brings people together. And it celebrates us <laughs> and uh, our way of, I think, familia and, and uh, just a cultural s sustenance. It's, uh, it's something that is, we can't let go of, we should never let go of. Mm -hmm. And that brings us together. And I think when people, especially today with altars, we're called to do altars for everything. And it's, sometimes it's a challenge because I don't know if people have in mind the Day of the Dead altar, but there's, you know, there's so many ways to celebrate through ofrendas. Because like I said, it's a, it's a concept, it's an idea, it's a style of living. It's a way of thinking, it's a way of coming together. It's a way of passing on your, your, your culture. It's a, it's a way of uh, looking to the future. Uh, it's so much more and so. I'm, I think I'm so blessed. And then to have my children and people that, many people are making altars today and I'm, that makes me happy. And I know people that I know who have been inspired because they're doing their, their things too. You know, It's something that has to be sustained as part of all our cultural practices that are empowering, that are nurturing and gives us it gives us meaning <laughs> in our lives. Well, you know, that background of altar making, and I always talk about the nacimientos, that practice, that endeavor is so rich. Uh, they always had, like I said, many things in many levels, and I always felt that when I, helped, even my mother's, my mother's nacimientos, and when I started, really uh, doing a lot of it in her later years. I used to love that each uh, vignette was, could stand by itself. It was like you make little nacimientos or little stories that you put all together to make a whole story. And the story isn't about Jesus, it ends up being about your town, about your, the country life, about the, you know, it, it's, it's so many other things, but it's all encompassed in this yearly nacimiento that has a lot of personal things and cultural things, historical things, religious things, Godzilla and cowboys and all these things that the kids' toys went in there too sometimes. <laughs> uh, but anyway, those, that format, I started to realize many years ago that the way that I'd like to have an altar was all these stories, all these vignettes. And I mean, it takes a long time for me. I would get back and say, oh, 
If I cut this off, this could still be a beautiful little altar. And so it's this style of, of uh, assemblage, somebody told me they called it. But it tells a story that, many stories that come together. And so I love that style because it's a narrative, it's a remembrance, it's an aesthetic thing, it's a work of art, and it's, I mean, it's so many things. So a lot of things go into it. Uh, yes, exactly. And that's exactly what happened, and you were a great part of that in creating all these parts to it that, that are told within this huge story of L.A. And, uh, and then making it work together, that is, that uh, it's a whole composition made out of very many elements, and many of them could stand by themselves, vignettes. And the stories that are told are many stories within this big picture story. And so at the Smithsonian, of course, we, it was for our family. It was the theme we picked, which is the best one for me, because that's the, what I know most about. And we could tell that story in many ways with all the people in it. And uh, so it was uh, in, that, in that frame of mind, or in that style, I guess you could call it, or format, I guess, of many, many things put together. And it was a wonderful time. It was like having a huge canvas that we could put everything that I wanted to, to remember in there, or that we wanted to, because you, you and your brothers are, in, uh, they're all sharing their stories too. They have the, the ideas of doing things, and it's wonderful. The thing that I liked, and I'm so glad that I thought of it, uh, I, I, I learned to make these, uh, I guess they were like estrellas, and I patterned them after really the straw stars that I've seen in Nacimientos in, in books from Yucatan and those rural places where they make things that paja. And I love the way they decorate, like an arch is made with those straw things and then they'll put a flower here and there. And I've always loved that idea. And so I made these with uh, corn husks, las hojas. I stripped them and tied them around a, a ring and it looks like a sun or a star. And so I said, I'm a, I've been wanting to use them in the, in the altars. I've made them as, you know, like hanging things for the patio or things like that. So I showed my friend Pat Foster to help me make some because uh, she had lots of time and so I had her make some little ones. Then, uh, then when she brought them back to me and I made a couple more larger ones and when I saw them, I said, how can I use them in the Nacimiento? And when we were setting up the arch, it was beautiful, huge arch, because it was a, such a big space. I don't know, it was about 12 feet high almost. So a lot was gonna go in front of it. And I thought of the Pleiades, the stories Mama told me about when I was a kid. East LA, of course, was, it was wonderful. <laughs> it still is, but then it, we could see the stars at night. We'd play outside at night in summertime, and my mother would say, mira, son las siete hermanas. And she had a story about Mama Pola would talk about las siete hermanas. And it had, it wasn't clear to me exactly the story, but it was, had to do with ancestral souls, but uh, related to the myths, mythology that they learned from who knows where, you know, they didn't have it. Somebody had represented this god or that god, but there were stories that were told in her town or my, when Mama Pola was young. And so my mother would always point out the, the I didn't know they were the Pleiades until I, I was in high school. Because I would always say, what is, what are you, they're the seven sisters, las siete hermanas. And so then, it, with those straw stars that we had, put them inside the arch to represent the Pleiades, the siete hermanas. But, not as hermanas, but as the stories of the ancestors that were told by my mother and maybe other people too. So I, I really love that touch because it was something, I got a lot of, we got a lot of things in there that I wanted to use and tell. And it was really beautiful, I thought. It, was, it had so many layers, uh, included as many relatives as, as I could think of. We had a few friends, I think, too. But I always like to use vintage photographs. I like to use black and white. And I like to use a lot of black as a backdrop. 
and it the I think the I got that from the, just the the memorials, especially in cemeteries from Mexico that I've seen. There, it's always a, like a black backdrop, and then they paint with hand white lettering. But I like that striking effect. And so the the one we did at Self of Graphics that you did the embellishment. Oh, I love that's one of my favorites. I started using the metal leaves from aluminum because that also reminded me of the folk art that is beautiful, that I love in Mexico, the, the frames, the lata, the candle holders there. And they're, they're elaborate, but they're made out of this simple material. That's what I love about the folk art. The simplest of materials that made, does wonders beautifully wrought, and it tells the story of people, how they value materials, how they value uh, stories and beauty out of stuff that you would say it's junk made sometimes. And so I love using, I really love that part of starting to do those. Well, we've been doing that for a few years now, but those are really striking to me and it just brings that, that, that um, image of folk art that goes with the stories of whatever it is you're telling about. I think that being recognized by an organization like ACTA who really celebrates cultural practices, cultural, the art of people, that it's a celebration of, of their lives. And like I just talked about it a little bit right now, how that art is, it's, it's almost utilitarian because it, it, it celebrates your own life and the materials that are at hand and that tell the story about people's resilience, creativity, and, uh, and resourcefulness too. But uh, I think all, all uh, folk are just like that. But you know, just focusing on our culture, my culture is, is something that's so marvelous, it's beyond it goes beyond just, you know, the idea of folk art. It tells, it gives so much, like, like all folk art does. And I always look, when I was teaching, I was always looking for uh, resonance in other cultures that reflected ours, because that is the story of people. Beyond the statues and these, you know, these flags and things like this, that is, that is outside of this realm of people's work, heart, their soul, their stories. It's so, it's so wonderful and I was just so blessed to be, to, ha to have been recognized by ACTA. And then when I applied for the apprenticeship, I became aware of all the other cultures. I mean, you know that there's other, many cultures in, just in our state or in our city, but imagine the richness, the stories of this, the fabric of the people who live here that's never, really looked at by the greater community, greater society, but they have brought, uh, ACTA has brought it to the level of, wow, look at all this rich history and beauty and culture, especially. It's just a, it's, it's a wonderful thing that ACTA has been there to bring these out especially in this country where the Western thought just dismisses everything that is not in a main museum or that is in Anglo-Saxon roots or European roots.